All right, biochemists, we are going to be thinking about moving from digestion into actual metabolism, um, production of ATP inside our cells. So I'm going to share my screen and we'll start thinking about some of those important components. All right. So uh, the learning goals that this uh, video will hopefully cover include uh, the definition of catabolic and anabolic processes. We're going to talk about where we get the energy to run our cellular processes. Um, we've already talked a little bit about why ATP is a good source of chemical energy for endergonic reactions, but we'll touch on that again. And we will use uh, the delta G equals delta G naught plus RT natural log of the equilibrium constant equation to help us explain how coupling ATP to endergonic reactions, um, sorry, that is coupling ATP hydrolysis uh, to endergonic reactions makes that process thermodynamically more favorable. And we're going to talk about electron carriers because they're going to be an important part of um, metabolic processes in our body. So we've talked about digestion, uh, but really we, we digest food, we intake food so that we can use the breakdown products down here for uh, metabolic uh, processes in our body. That is for um, catabolism to make ATP and anabolism to build new molecules for our cells. So uh, we're gonna be really talking about burning our dietary fuel for energy. Um, and this is very similar to uh, what goes on when we burn a fire, for example. So we've got logs down here at the bottom uh, that are made out of carbon and hydrogen and also oxygen because they're cellulose is uh, chains of glucose. Um, so when we oxidize this carbon with the help of oxygen in the air, um, the reaction that occurs is really strongly exergonic. We're releasing a lot of energy as heat here. Um, water is released and also the oxidized carbon is released. We are going to be oxidizing so much carbon between now and the end of the semester. So let's talk about um, this process of metabolism, but from more of a, a living cells perspective. Uh, if we're thinking about uh, photosynthesis, we've got light energy coming from the sun that will combine CO2 from the air into organic molecules like glucose. And then of course, we as non-plants, uh, will take those organic molecules, combine them with oxygen, just like we saw on the previous slide, and uh, we'll break down those organic molecules, uh, releasing CO2 and water as waste products, byproducts, but also harvesting some of that energy as ATP and releasing some of the energy as heat. And so this ATP is what we're really aiming for uh, because it, it powers the work that our body does. So we're releasing CO2 and water into the environment. Of course, they can then be used by plants again um, to start this whole cycle over. Um, it's important to know that uh, we only do the bottom half of this cycle, but plants actually do the whole cycle. They have photosynthetic tissue and plants are also doing cellular respiration. Our cells are only doing cellular respiration, uh, but if you figured out how to do photosynthesis, please do let me know. Um, and it's the ATP here that, that we're really focusing on producing. So when we, we started talking about digestion, we're thinking about getting or gaining organic molecules into our system so that we can harvest the energy in the form of ATP um, for work inside our bodies. So uh, this is sort of a, a backbone of the metabolic pathways that we'll go on to discuss in more detail. Um, really, this is glucose metabolism. So we're starting with glucose up here, um, glycolysis in yellow, and then uh, pyruvate from glycolysis can enter into the citric acid cycle and ultimately um, electron carriers from the citric acid cycle will go on to electron transport chain. 
what I'm, why I'm really showing you this is uh, to sort of remind us all that uh, as we're thinking about glucose breakdown in the next couple of weeks, uh, this isn't, this is not just about glucose because glucose breakdown can help us build nucleotides like DNA and RNA. Uh, it can help us build amino acids, glycolipids, and other proteins. Um, it can help us build lipids. It can help us build varieties of amino acids and types of nucleotides. Uh, here's some more amino acids that can be um, built from offshoots of this pathway. Um, and similarly, the citric acid cycle connects to other important pathways in our body. So citrate can leave the pathway um, to help become cholesterol or fatty acids inside the body. Alpha ketoglutarate can leave this pathway or this cycle um, to become many different amino acids. Um, succinyl CoA is important for making heme uh, if you're an animal um, or chlorophyll if you're not an animal. Um, and then oxaloacetate can leave this cycle and become many different types of amino acids or purines and pyrimidines, that is bases uh, for nucleotides. Um, we're showing these arrows only going in one direction, but really uh, they can also feed back into these pathways. That is cholesterol and fatty acid breakdown can feed into the citric acid cycle or the breakdown of alanine can help produce pyruvate um, if the body is in a starvation state, has proteins, but, but no sugars. Um, so these red arrows are shown pointing out, but really they can go in as well. And we'll talk more about the connection between all of these different pathways and our glucose breakdown a little bit more as we move forward. A really key part of uh, all of these cellular reactions is the hydrolysis of ATP. And we've talked about that before, so I'm not going to belabor the point here, um, but Primarily, this uh, bond between the uh, third phosphate group and ADP is a really high energy bond. Remember that these phosphates have a lot of negatively charged oxygens, so this is a really high energy bond. Um, hydrolysis of this bond is very exergonic, and it releases a lot of energy into the cell. Um, negative 7.3 kcals per mole or about negative 30.5 uh, kilojoules per mole, depending on the units that we're in here. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, ATP, but also other high energy molecules that are inside our body. So let's look at a uh, graph for just a second here. This graph is helping us to think about where our cellular energy is stored. So let's say you're going to the gym, okay? And that's time along this x-axis here. Um, and as we're at the gym, we need energy, right? Um, we're just living our lives, but let's say we're at the gym. Um, and for the first couple seconds that's that we're doing whatever jumping jacks that we're doing, um, we start with a really high level of ATP but you can see that ATP drops down over time. There's much, the, the ATP energy uh, is depleted very quickly. However, we do have this sort of backup energy form called creatine phosphate. And you can see uh, in early seconds to minutes, creatine phosphate can be produced quickly, even though it does then fall off again um, after a couple minutes. Creatine phosphate sort of fills in the gap where anaerobic, before anaerobic respiration, or um, even a higher level of aerobic respiration starts to kick in inside your body. And so this would be, once we're running a marathon here, we're no longer relying on cellular levels of ATP. I mean, we are relying on ATP, but we have to build new ATP using these aerobic and anaerobic uh, mechanisms inside our cell. We'll spend a lot of time talking about aerobic metabolism uh, in the next couple of weeks, but I really wanna focus on this creatine phosphate and, and what that is all about. So energy in our cells can be stored 
in phosphocreatine. So on the right hand side here, we've got phosphocreatine uh, and just creatine on the left, you can see phosphocreatine has a phosphate group added onto it. And phosphocreatine can be converted into creatine. And when that occurs, um, this phosphate group is donated to ADP, producing ATP, okay? So in a muscle cell that's at rest, we have about four millimolar ATP and not very much ADP. We have a lot though of phosphocreatine and even quite a bit of regular old regular creatine. As ATP, ATP stores are depleted quickly um, during our exercise, we can convert this phosphocreatine into creatine um, and produce ATP uh, with that conversion here. So when we're building uh, ATP from ADP, the cost is about 7.3 kcals per mole. This is an endergonic reaction. But the um, energy released by uh, going from phosphocreatine to creatine is greater than that. It's negative 11.8 kcals per mole. So these two reactions put together are still an exergonic reaction overall, making it energetically favorable. Um, so we can produce, uh, when original cellular stores of ATP are depleted. We can produce more ATP really quickly without involving the mitochondria um, through the uh, conversion of phosphocreatine into creatine and then the donation of this phosphate group. So creatine is actually um, an energy uh, supplement. It's not super well tested. Um, and I want you to think for a second about what type of biochemical rationale would uh, doctors or vitamin people have for recommending creatine to athletes? And secondarily, what type of exercise, it, like what type of athletes doing what type of exercise are going to most benefit from supplementation of creatine? So pause the video for a second, check out this graph and, and think about that. So I think uh, the rationale would be uh, if we can add in more phosphocreatine or uh, even just the creatine backbone, um, take that in as a supplement, then we'll be holding more, uh, we'll be having more energy stores sort of on hold for quick production of ATP. So this is our quick depletion of cellular ATP. But because we have high levels of creatine phosphate, we can quickly produce new ATP. Um, so if we're bulking up on creatine or creatine phosphate, um, that means we can go for even longer time um, without having to really utilize um, anaerobic or aerobic metabolism to build new ATP. But of course, even creatine gets converted or depleted pretty quickly um, as it produces ATP. And so it's only going to be short term exercise or like quick bursts of exercise that are going to be, that are going to benefit from creatine supplementation. Marathon runners, um, like long distance bike riders, not going to benefit from creatine supplementation. Those folks are really going to be using aerobic or ana and anaerobic metabolism. But uh, folks who are doing sprints, folks who are doing weightlifting, this uh, creatine supplementation does make sense for these folks. So we've also talked about uh, these um, equations using delta G and equilibrium constants before, but I just want to get your mind thinking about them again, really focusing on this uh, equation right here. So the conversion of ATP plus pyruvate into phosphoenol pyruvate 
and ADP. Um, and this is actually a reaction that occurs during glycolysis. So ATP plus pyruvate is converted into phosphoenolpyruvate or PEP plus ADP. So first we want to uh, convert or rather calculate the delta G and also the KEQ at um, standard temperature for this reaction using the data from the table below. In order to do this equation, I'm going to uh, type right here within PowerPoint so we can see a little bit more clearly what's going on. So if we look at this table down here, um, this is showing us the standard free energy of hydrolysis of high energy phosphorylated compounds. So here, this is the hydrolysis of ATP to ADP. And that is, uh, that earns us negative uh, 30.5 kilojoules per mole. So I'm gonna draw that up here, ATP to ADP, negative 30.5 kJ per mole. Okay. And then what about pyruvate? to PEP or phosphoenol pyruvate. Let's look for that down here. It's actually the first uh, entry in this table. This is, remember, this is the hydrolysis of phosphorylated compounds. So really this is gonna say PEP into pyruvate. Um, that's what we're looking at here, PEP into pyruvate. And that releases negative 61.9 Kj per mole. Wow, the phosphorylation of, or rather the hydrolysis of PEP into pyruvate is super exergonic. It releases so much energy. But actually, if we look at our equation up here, um, we're interested in the reverse reaction. That is adding phosphate to pyruvate to produce PEP. So let's switch this around, pyruvate to PEP that actually costs 61.9 kilojoules per mole, okay? So uh, because we're doing both of these uh, reactions within this equation, we need to sum them together. Um, can we not just do that? We need to sum them together. Um, so 61.9 kilojoules per mole, Minus 30.5 kilojoules per mole is 31.4. I'll put a plus sign in the front. Is plus 31.4 kilojoules per mole. So that's pretty endergonic, um, which like is maybe not something that's going to happen uh, happily at the cellular level. Um, but let's talk a little bit about how it actually could occur. So I'm gonna get rid of this table. We've gotten all we need from it. And let's do some math here. So our Delta G reaction uh, or equation is this. Delta G equals negative RT times the natural log of KEQ. Terrific. Um, of course, you remember that KEQ is the uh, concentration of products over the concentration of reactants, but let's just go with this so far. Uh, this uh, plus 31.4 is actually our delta G for the reaction. Um, we're saying this is the delta G that you get from doing, from doing this uh, reaction. So let's fill in this equation. Thirty-one point four kJ per mole equals negative. Um, we're going to use the gas constant here for R zero point zero 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 eight three. I think I put in too many zeros. Eight three one four uh, kilojoules per mole K. Okay. And then that K comes from temperature. So we set up here, we're working at 25 degrees Celsius. Um, if we convert from 25 degrees C to, to Kelvin, that gets us to 298 Kelvin. So let's add that in here. 
And then we need to do the natural log of K EQ. Okay, um, in order to do this, let's first divide both sides by this. Um, and if we do that, we get negative 12.67. So remember, we've got a negative right here. Negative 12.67 equals the natural log of KEQ. Of course, to get rid of a natural log, we uh, take E to the power of both sides. So let's do E to the power of this. I don't want a big E, I want a small E. And we'll do E to the power of uh, the natural log of KEQ. So if we do that, um, we will show that KEQ equals 0 0.000003 one four, uh, or um, three times 10 to the negative six um, units. So KEQ three times 10 to the negative six. And remember our KEQ is products over reactants. And really, let's fill them in here. Our products are PEP and ADP, and our reactants are ATP and pyruvate. So this is a number less than one. That's telling me that um, there's, well, that needs a close parenthesis. That's telling me that this is a very small number and this is a very large number. So that's our Delta G. We calculated that using the table and our KEQ we calculated using uh, the equation that takes advantage of Delta G. Go back to this um, question again uh, and say, what's the equilibrium ratio of pyruvate to PEP, phosphoenyl pyruvate, if the ratio of ATP to ADP is 10? I'm going to get rid of this graph again. I'm going to go back here. We just said that this is our KEQ. I'd like to look at that uh, right here. KEQ. Great. So the equilibrium ratio, and that's what we're looking at here. This is our equilibrium ratio. If the ratio of ATP to ADP is 10. So let's put a one right there and a 10 right here. Okay. So I'll, I'll write this out in another way. Three times 10 to the negative six equals PEP over pyruvate. This whole thing gets multiplied by one over 10. Well, another way we could write that is multiplying both sides by 10. So let's do that. Three times negative five times 10, in fact, to the negative five. Equals uh, the concentration of PEP over concentration of pyruvate. But the question here is asking, what's the equilibrium ratio of pyruvate to PEP? So we just need to flip this whole thing upside down. That is, we can take one over, uh, one over our value here. So let me rewrite it and say pyruvate over PEP is equal to one over three times 10 to the negative five. Well, if you use your calculator to do that, uh, you'll find one over three times 10 to the negative five 
is uh, something like, whoa, where did I put it? 3.2 times 10 to the fourth. Um, that is, there's like, make this smaller. Make this smaller. There's like 32,000 more molecules of pyruvate than there are of PEP at equilibrium, uh, even when there's 10 times as much ATP as ADP. So we used our, um, we use a table to calculate delta G. From delta G, we can ca calculate KEQ. And we can think about how KEQ actually relates to the concentration of the different uh, components of the reaction. So we're gonna use this information as we move forward thinking about metabolism. Um, I hope this has helped you think or refresh your brain a little bit as we move forward into metabolism. And we'll talk again soon. Bring questions. <laughs>